Raggy's Connick Rugby Podcast. I'm Rob Murphy and Connick's won the game, David. Yeah, lovely, great. Isn't it nice? Isn't it nice? 24 points to 12, Alan Deacon. Yeah, good win. To get that bonus point against that wind in the second half was um, pretty good going, it has to be said, because it just seemed to get stronger and stronger. You said the bonus point, so now I have to say to Lindy, attack play from the back line looking good. I think the attack play from the backs from everyone was actually particularly good and I thought the forwards did extremely well against that side who were actually very strong up front you know, for long parts of it so I thought it was all round, it was a pretty good performance. Well, we're going to hear first of all from myself and uh, on the commentary on Galway Bay FM then we're going to hear some post-game audio from Andy Friend and a player who we confirm. Oh, it's Mac Hansen. there you go. We also have some in-match audio from yourself and William. Della Hunt to throw in. The movement towards the front. The throw is good. Delling the target. The mall goes towards the line. It's also going towards the touchline. Connacht are over. Connacht have scored. That is exactly what this game needed and what they needed in these early stages. Connor Oliver, I believe, is the man who's got it. Scrum is good. Well, it's drifting in field now. Oh, Marmion scoops that ball away to Hansen, who has to check his run. They try to let him chip over the top. That's wonderful from Hansen. Collected brilliantly by Tom Farrell. He's looking for someone on the shoulder. It is gone forward. He's gone towards the line. He's got a score to try. I think he might have got the touchdown. He has. Marmion has had a good first half. There's no question. Bila. Carty. Oh, this is a chance. Looping around as O'Halloran off the pass from Farrell. Tiernan O'Halloran's going to score. A stats man Allen said he was due a try. Well, they scored underneath the post connect. That's the third try of the first half. Okay, William, we're, we're in the press box. I forgot to do 20 minutes, but I'm not sitting beside you, which is probably why I forgot. But it's half time and Connacht lead by 19 points to nil. It's looking good, but they will be against the wind in the second half. Yeah, I think they, they needed that score right on half time there just to stretch out the lead a bit. Sharks are struggling in these conditions. They're not sure what to do. They've kicked the ball a lot. It's now teeming down on the poor kiddies who are having their mini rugby. Uh, I wouldn't mind a bit of this rain early in the second half on the Sharks. I think that might switch a few off. Connacht had to work really hard there. They're not a side oozing with confidence, Connacht, and you can tell that. I think one more try would probably put this game beyond the Sharks. A bit of rain early in the second half now, and I think that might uh, put them to bed. Certainly, Mike. And it was great to see young Kyle Ford getting his. That was his first try for Connacht, so a uh, little celebration there too. Yeah, absolutely, and he took it well. He hasn't looked out of place out there. A um, couple of big performances again. I mean, Keen Prendergast has come on for Oshin Dowling, which is a little worrying to come off that early. It was an injury, uh, but he is tearing into people. And uh, Kieran Marmion's having a very good game. He's he's dealing with a scrum that's under. It's, I wouldn't say it's under pressure. It's the scrums are quite. Physical, they really are proper. Yeah. They're nearly old Great fashioned scrums. scrums. Great scrums, yeah. And uh, Hurley Langton's had to pick the ball up a few times at eight, and he's done yeah. it really, really well. Yeah. And that's created a bit of space. So there's a lot to like. They've just got to finish this off now. Getting scrappy ball from what looks like a clean mall, and then Jack Carty just decides, all right, I'm going to kick this. And he does so, and he launches it in the air, and the Sharks have it, and they're going to pop it back. But a block down from Kyle Ford, and he's going to go in for a try. Yeah. What a take from Ford to score that try. Wonderful stuff. His second try of the game. He's having a stormer, the 21 year old. 62 minutes. Connacht lead by 24 points to seven. They have the bonus point, but they'll still want to put this game away. Yeah, it could still get a little bit messy, but they've done well playing against the wind. Uh, it's been a scrappy enough half. Another lovely try for Coho Ford. Uh, great work by him on a block down where he went through. But you feel now this game could get a little bit spaced out, and it's also the chance the Sharks really have to try something. They've just got a score. Connacht will need one more try to put this absolutely to bed. Conditions are difficult, but the rain only landed on the kiddies at half time and the Sharks have escaped that particular uh, situation at the sports ground but it is very windy it is indeed we'll talk again on full time as the Sharks are on the attack yet again final score Connacht 24 Sharks 12 made hard work but that absolute unbelievable wind and rain in that last 20 minutes made it impossible for Connacht to get out of their own half yeah and they worked well enough in defence we also saw something new a try and a conversion for the Sharks awarded uh, and then called back because the TMO insisted that the referee have a look at it, and it was called back because there was a Sharks player offside playing the ball. So 
I thought once the conversion had gone over, but apparently you can review it up to the kickoff. Wow. Uh, seems to be the situation, and um, that's a first. Uh, it wasn't a first for the wind and rain. It's five points. That's all Connacht needed tonight. They had to win this game. They had to get five. Sharks looked a little bit better when they tried to play a bit of rugby. Maybe if they tried to actually keep the ball in hand in the first half yeah. rather than kicking it away. But uh, generally, I'd say Connacht are pretty pleased and I'd say the Sharks will feel they put in a, they put in a performance. Uh, they picked a team that was good enough to do that but they have come away with nothing they get on the plane they go back home play a European game get on the plane come back to London it's, it's understandable why they're underpowered tonight and it has finished in horrendous conditions they were lucky we didn't get this all through the game it would have been nearly impossible it certainly would ok here's the post-match interviews and then it'll be Rob Andy, uh, just to start, uh, it's, it's great to be talking after a victory. Obviously, the fans were soaked and freezing, but they're going home happy. Yeah, and again, a compliment to the Connacht fans. Like, you wouldn't get many fan bases turning up in those sort of conditions. But again, we just had over 4,000 people here tonight. And uh, yeah, we're going home with a... Well, they're going home having watched a bonus point win, which is good. Well, you heard this week the Sharks were keeping a lot of their frontliners at home. What was your thought process into how you were going to approach this game? Um, nervous because you know they can be big banana skins for you, where people knock off, and you know there's an assumption that a team that's that's turning up is not going to be their strongest team. But as you saw there tonight, and I said a compliment to Joe, their, their coach, they never stop trying. Um, they're still good footballers, uh, so it's nice to get the bonus point win on there. It's probably nice too. After all the talk about Connacht's attack play, and we know 204 points in 11 games is very low uh, return to see a 24 points, but b that kind of backline play that we've been crying out for. Yeah, and uh, you know, I said after last week's game, I, I honestly feel like we're on the verge of all that clicking now. So to see that come through and um, on a night like tonight, in particular the style of rugby that we tried to play and the belief that we had in playing that way and then for four of the, the, the tries to stick was, uh, I said, I think it's a compliment to the team. Ford, man of the match, two tries, not bad going for the young lad. I thought he was brilliant. Um, you know, it, that's a that's a pretty hard fought position, that number 12 spot. Uh, David Hawkshaw, as we know, got an injury last week. We've got Tom Daly, we've got Bundy Aku, and then you've got young Fordy comes in and and, and uh, yeah, deserve, thoroughly deserve that man of the match performance. So, um, Real compliment and, uh, to him and, and really proud of his performance. Is it simplistic to say that's the benefits of the pitch on a night like this when you see that kind of rugby from your back line in these conditions? Yeah, it helps. Uh, yeah, one of the reasons, I think, uh, there's lots of reasons why Connacht went down the route of a 3G pitch, but one of them is that we know the brand that's, that's in our DNA. That's the rugby we want to play. It gives us, um, it, it gives us a, a consistent at least one element of consistency um, you know, on a night like tonight where you had wind and rain and all sorts of things going on, you, you know you've got a surface you can play on and more importantly we've got a surface we can train on every week and every session we can train on that surface whereas pre previously we haven't been able to do that so um, you know, I think the boys are loving playing on that figured out a difficult front row from the opposition as well. You've done that a few times this season. Uh, that's a good sign, isn't it, that you can work your tra way through problems? Yeah, and that's a that's a compliment to, to our, our forward pack, our front row in particular, and Cully Tucker in particular. I think what he's done with that scrum this year is outstanding. I think we're, we're probably the number one team in the, in the competition at the moment for ball in, ball out success. Um, so... I think he's doing wonderful things with them. They're a good scrummage inside. We knew that when you could see their front row, what they picked there. I know you say that a lot of their front liners weren't here. That's their front liners there, certainly one of them in particular. Um, and that was always going to cause us trouble, but we handled it well. I have to ask just at the end, then, the chase for the playoffs. Have you looked at the table? Do you feel like Connor can get themselves back in there? Yeah, I do. I, I, I actually don't study it enormously. Um, I know we've got six games. Um, we know we've got to keep winning. We know we've got to keep getting points but and that's all within our control so next two weeks we're not where we're, we're Challenge Cup but, but then we've got the Lions to finish this block and then we come back and over that Six Nations we've got some games that um, put us back into UIC contention and if we can keep winning like that and winning well then playoffs are uh, within our control. Mike, what's the reflection on that? It was a hard night out there, physical game in difficult conditions, but Connacht got the job done, got the five points. Yeah, um, we knew that, you know, coming in, I think any other team, um, 
coming down here and with those with that weather and whatnot, they're going to struggle. Like we're we're pretty used to playing in that. We train in that all the time. So uh, we I thought we used the wind in the first half really well. Like didn't didn't kick too much, and when it was time to play, we did. So um, and then second half, yeah, it's just tough to get out of those corners when you're um, kicking into it. Like it, the, the ball, it just doesn't want to go far at all for you. So. Uh, but I thought in the second half we defended well, so um, there's a lot of positives all around. But you know, there's still plenty to plenty to work on. Um, uh, yeah. When you're talking about the when you're playing into the wind like that and you can't get out, is that all about concentration then? That you know you're not going to get massive distances off a kick. You've just got to keep grinding away, keep passing the ball, and then get it off the field. Yeah, I think you just got to know when to play, when to kick, um, and then you just got to be disciplined which has been a bit of a struggle for us. So, we, you know, we still just piggybacked um, them down the field. And if you're giving away penalties, um, no matter if you get a turnover or not, like you're, as we were saying, like you're still stuck down there. It makes it a lot harder compared to if you make them make a mistake, you know, 40 metres out, and then you boot it down, or you can play rugby from there um, far easier than five metres out from your own line. And overall, there was a lot of pressure on tonight for Connacht. I mean, there was, it was a must-win game. You've got the five points. Does does that give a little bit of relief and a bit of maybe more confidence when you go in next week against Breve? You change competitions um, because it's just, it's about wins now for the rest of this season to get that get up that table in the URC. Yeah, um, you know I think we can use use the next couple of weeks as uh, you know I think maybe to try some stuff out and um, I think just play go back to playing the footy. You know. The, that Connick is known for, just throwing the ball around and, and having fun out there. So that definitely takes a little bit of pressure off, but, you know, we still got eight very important games coming up. Um, but, I, you know, it's good. Like, we've got the Irish teams out of the way. We've got the South Africa trip out of the way. So, you know, it's very doable. Um, I think I saw something that we're at, like, 9% or something to make the, um, make the final. So... Uh, if everybody want, yeah, has that attitude towards us, you know, uh, we, we think we, we, we're more than capable to, to be making this eight and we're going to be pushing right to the end. So you'll take that and turn it on its head and say, we'll show you? Yeah, as I, as I said, look, we, we've done the hard yards. It, not everything went our way, unfortunately, but... Um, and, and saying that, you know, the games we've got coming up aren't going to be easy by any means. Um, you've still got to play well against any team in this competition. Um, I think, but yeah, there's a lot of lot of teams that have got a tougher road home than us. So, um, no, we'll, we'll we'll take it in stride and go from there. And we're back. Uh, great to hear from Mac as well, actually, because it's been a while since we have. He's going to be a busy man in the next month or two. But by God, Dave, he lights up a game. Ah, oh, jeez, yeah. Uh, he, he gets the fans going. I mean, I, I think every barber in the country is now going to be del- in, in Galway's going to be delighted because because he's uh, shaved the moustache, he's uh, cut the hair. Uh, so the uh, the white scum cap is still there for the kids. So that's good. Um, oh, it was brilliant. I mean, it needs sometimes you just need something to spark the crowd. I don't think I think the crowd was to be fair was in the game from minute one. I think something about South African teams just makes conduct fans up but what were we doing where the first try was a forward strike and we were doing very well up front but we weren't quite seeing a spark from the back and you know mac just does that little chip in behind faz catches it into call for that's it lights it up the best move of the match unfortunately has that tiny little knock on from from faz. was it a knock on i'm not sure i'd have to look it back it looked game. like on any of the video replays i i've I said uh, first of all a hansen like beating the man but obviously getting chopped down but somehow acrobatically Finding his balance again and then staying in field. It was pretty, like the tumble was the first part of it, then staying in field. I thought it wasn't a knock on. I thought it was a knock on. Ah, stop. <laughs> Lindley, there was some great scores though. Tiernan Halloran's on the stroke at half time was critical as well. Well, there's, they're wonderful to see a man like Tiernan O'Holloran who has come back into contention and is actually pro- and is producing and looks like he's enjoying himself and I'm absolutely delighted for him you know I two, two weeks ago we yeah. were criticizing him on this part Ab- and well. absolutely and and with good reason and yes. you know um but that's that's the beauty isn't it of of rugby and that's the beauty of mentality and someone who's a professional that they can obviously know possibly that they're not producing maybe a hundred percent is what they 
of what they can do, and then they actually go out and they work on it. And look, we don't know what goes on in people's head. We're not privy to what maybe it was going on in Turner and Holleran's head a few weeks ago. We don't know what's happened since then to change it. But all we know is tonight he actually produced, he looked like a player of old that we always remember, being able to carve open space. And, you know, I'm delighted for him. I mean, he's he's been a, a, a wonderful servant in Connor Rugby, and I'm delighted to see him out there performing at that level again. One thing I like... Yeah. He, listen, he listens to the podcast and he's annoyed. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a sponsor. Do you know, one thing I liked from Williams' co la last week was he just made the point that, you know, without ever being spectacular or, or hollering when he went off, the back line looked disorganised in defence and you suddenly start to think, is that what it is? Yeah, and as, as I, I think I said last week, and again, Sulster a couple of years ago, it was exactly the same sort of thing. He brings a presence in, his, in the back line, certainly in defence. Uh, and today we saw something in attack from him that we haven't seen in a long time. It's great to see. Brilliant link, because I was going to mention that as well. You mentioned, Dave, Tom Farrell popped it back inside. Farrell did so well on that try. It was more than just, you know, faz, as you call him, just winning the ball. But the way he drew the defender to re give that extra bit of space. If you think about that, you think that's a training ground move. I think there's a training ground move been in there somewhere, but I don't think that was the training ground no. move because, because the, first, the pass that goes to Mac yeah. is really bad. That's what the thing is. It's, it's, this wasn't off a set piece. This is a really bad pass, and Mac is kind of off balance, puts the kick through, but they clearly knew that something was going to happen. So maybe they've practiced Maybe they have done it. I'm not quite sure with that level of stupid pass in the first place. But yeah, Tom does incredibly well, catches the ball. But more importantly... He makes yardage. It's not just a case of catch the ball and immediately pass the forward because then Carl has an awful long way to go. But he effectively makes the try because by the time Carl gets tackled, he is basically going to slide over. And he does very well, by the way. He is held up yeah, initially. There's more to it than he, that. He wriggles yeah. over. So I'm not saying that he had nothing to do. He had an awful lot to do. But if Tom doesn't catch the ball and make those yards after catching it, then that's a lot more difficult for Carl. And we're not looking at a stroke. We maybe not be looking at a try. And what I liked about Carl Ford is he fell to the ground, I think, faster than he needed to because he realised there was momentum to be had from sliding. So I think that's just a bit of clever play. Listen, Lily, the Hawk show goes down injured. Ford uh, steps up. Carl Ford was superb uh, tonight, and it's really exciting. Yeah, I actually haven't seen much of Cattle Ford play, to be perfectly honest with you. So to see him out there tonight, he just looks like he belongs there, doesn't he? I mean, you would... man as well, for yeah, a young lad. Yeah, he is. And, uh, you know, and so it's so important because, you know... He he is a local boy. He's a Corinthian lad. He's produced all his rugby through his family, you know, and, uh, and we all knew his dad. And I think it's so important that someone like Carter Ford is coming through the system. He's just one of several coming through the system. And that he's, he's I suppose he's at a stage and a level where he's equal now to other players in that team. Sometimes you look at the local players, they come in, you know, you wonder whether they're going to make it. You know, are they there on merit? Are they there because they're local? Some of them make it, some of them don't. And Carl Ford looked, you know, he looked, he belonged there, you know. And I think he's got a great, fu great future and I'm delighted to see him, you know, playing in there. And he was playing against an international class player. Rogan Bransberg got a cap this summer. So, like, it's not as though he's not, he's play, he was playing against, you know, one of the big players. He was playing against a top, top class international. Even the second half when Cronje came on, he was superb uh, at out half as well. Uh, Flores went to full back and it's probably a little bit better. Before I go to you, Dave, if you don't mind, I want to go back to Alan because one thing I was doing on your stats was just looking at the trend of scrum half out half combos. That's four times, and I might be wrong on this. You can correct me next week if I'm wrong, but four times Marmion and Cardi have started this year in four wins. Yeah, yeah. They're, 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 funnily enough, overall, it's a better win ratio for... You've said for that before, but I just wonder, over the years, did Marmion and Carty end up together in the, in the big interpros more often, and maybe there's a bit of a kind of a, a trend in those stats that maybe doesn't tell the full truth? Well, I'll, I'll get Danny on that one. Uh, and just well, but just sure this but season yeah, alone, so we're saying Munster, Scarlet and Breve, and now this game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and they look comfortable together. They look, you know, and that's probably the best game I've seen Marmion play in quite a while, it has to be said. Um, you know, I thought he was excellent. I thought he played a, you know, a really, really good game. And talking about, as Linny was mentioning, the young players, I thought Dara Murray is again a guy who looks as though he's been playing second row for the last five years for Connacht. And I think Dara Murray didn't actually play la much last year because he got an injury in his very first lineup for the very first Eagles game. So he's come a long way. Admittedly, so is his hair. He had long hair then. It's even longer now, and it'll be short tomorrow. Um, I think we have to look at some. I think it's great to see, as to go back to Carl Ford. Carl Ford is an inspiration for someone to say like Hugh Gavin, who's now in the current 
Wellington to 20 set up or Harry West who's on the bench or John Devine who, uh, as well they can say well, well how, how, what's our progression line look through and to see guys like Dylan Tony Martin and Cal Ford coming through gives those guys the incentive because we've seen it we've seen it with with the other provinces like Neil Doak uh, Nathan Doak uh, was was the was on was the scrum half inside Ford, and we see how what he how he's gone on. It's great to see the Ford coming through. It's good for Ireland. But it's very good for our guys. And encourages the kids. Encourages those poor sodden kids at half time to keep going out and horrific. Balance slow was it Monavay as well. Monavay, they played out in a storm, but because they can think, well, how do I get through? So well, Cahill Ford started off, played minis, played uh, Corinthians, came through the system there, got into got into Connacht squads, got into Ireland squads, got into. Professional rugby scores two ties in RT on a Saturday evening. There was That's one, there was one young lad in one of the clubs, and I don't want to even mention the club because you don't want to be picking lads out too soon. But my God, he looks good. I'm not going to mention the team. He was good though. All right, enough of that. Uh, getting to the forwards. Speaking of players coming true, Darren Murray. He's getting his hair cut out there <laughs> for charity. Uh, the mullet's gone, uh, but I think he's established himself now beyond the mullet. <laughs> well done on him. His uh, under twenty career was fantastic. We've been excited about him coming true, and like his brother, he's really now under the force he is and there's a as I call it a, a sporting intelligence a rugby intelligence he seems to be able to do things and see things a smidgen before other players mm. um, and he's also been driven on by the likes of Josh Murphy who I thought was phenomenal tonight. it's more like it from Josh there was a couple of games where I was wondering where he, where he was his, where was his early season form but he's back yeah, yeah, I think he had a knock. He had uh, he had that head knock, yes, which that's what seems to be clear, and, yeah. it seems to be fully clear now. And and he was throwing himself about as again was Kean Prendergast. Like we've got an amazing young pack. Seamus Hurley Langton at the back row. I mean, he he was steady. Well, certainly the number eight as a number eight play, playing behind the scrum that was under quite a lot of pressure at times. He never fumbled the ball. He never gave up the ball. Actually, Kean Prendergast did well when he went to number eight when we were down to fourteen men, and he managed to do a decent job. You have to credit the forwards coaches. They're, they're doing a hell of a job with that pack. And the backs now seem to be starting to click. So let's hope we see that for next week. David is just been uh, second string Sharks. And we have blown the Ulster game a couple of weeks ago. So we don't want to kind of lose the runner. Well, no, we, the, the table doesn't lie. We're in the position we're in because of, because of how we've done things. But, you know, when the history books are written and they will see that we have beaten the Sharks, they won't notice that this team was was their uh, was their B team, was their Curry Cup team. Uh, I'm sorry, but as we said, Van Rensburg is an international cap player. I think Ovinter played last week. I think Ovinter, and we didn't we didn't see anything. We, we actually said, I forgot Van Rensburg was on the pitch in the first half. Now, they made a huge difference. They brought on Grant Williams. They brought on Ian O'Clonia. They made a huge difference. Uh, but the player that took up was Vol. Mink, who is an international, who is a very close, who's regular player for them in the URC. So, given the conditions, given, yeah, it wasn't the strongest team, but that's a team that wants to put, they want to knock guys out. Those guys kind of, there's a degree of, well, why are we the Curry Cup guys? We are as good as the, the guys who got left behind. So, there was the, their coaching staff definitely think they're as good as the guys who got left behind. I'm very impressed by their coaching staff, very intelligent, very thoughtful. I think they got slightly screwed on their, their try that was disallowed because I'm sorry, if, I always thought the rule was if the conversion was taken, it doesn't matter whether it... Well, that rule has changed. Yep. So they didn't. So I hear you. It's, it's a law and they can, they can change it right up to the point where the kickoff is before kickoff yeah. is taken. And Jack went and asked them to, to do and it. So fair play to Jack. And it gets the TMO time to look at it. Just let the conversion go ahead. No harm done. Right. Uh, here's some audio from Joey Mangalo speaking to William Davis after the game. Joey, you've been in your changing room there with your lads. Uh, that was a tough night here at the sports ground for the team. It was also very difficult conditions to play in. What's your initial reaction? Um, initially, <clears throat> there, there's a sense that the boys fought well. We really asked them to show character and to stay in the fight as long as we can because we knew you don't get a victory here um, after 60 or even 50 minutes. You only get it after 80, 85 minutes. So we knew that. Um, I thought we really fought hard that first 20 minutes into the wind, um, and I think it probably took a lot more out of us than what we thought. Um, then the way the 9 and 10 handled the game in the, into the wind I thought was brilliant. I could really compliment them. And then the two that came on in the second half to help us chase the game, I thought they were good as well. Um, I hope that makes sense. Overall, with the team that you brought, that was, was a baptism of fire for some of them, to, obviously to just come up here and play, but also to get that sort of wind and you escape the worst of the rain at times, but uh, that's something maybe they're not used to. 
I think those are the blessings and disguises that we don't see in games like these. Um, they, these guys won't play in worse conditions ever. So this would have challenged their skill set. It would have challenged their mental fortitude to get through some difficult periods. So the learnings are phenomenal. I mean, the Flav who came, who started the game, it's his first start at URC. I mean, where, where else do you want to make your debut than he had? Can only be easier going forward. So I think there's a lot of individuals who've grown uh, massively from this experience. How did you find the synthetic surface as well? I mean, if that was played on a grass surface, it could have cut up to hell. But how do they actually find just the way it went for them on that surface? If you say caught up to hell, then I was in hell this time last year uh, with the Bulls because then the synthetic wasn't on. Um, so I think the synthetic just keeps the game alive a bit more. It quickens it slightly, uh, which is a bit more challenging for us South Africans. But overall, um, good stadium, good field. Um, it, 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 it provided for a pretty decent spectacle. What about that situation with the try that, and the conversion that was overturned? Uh, that sort of caught everybody on the hop a little bit. Uh, it would appear that in the laws you can, as before the kickoff, now review it. Was that did that come as a surprise? A massive surprise. Um, I was just saying to Friendy now, we felt that um, if we if that was allowed, and I think Lionel kicked it over, so 14-24 with 20 minutes to go, you could feel that the momentum was sort of heading our way. Their boys were working towards the touchline. So I think it was a bit of a punch in the gut for our boys because we had to work so much harder before we got that score again. Um, so, yeah, probably uh, I, I, I don't want to speak about the technical stuff because I haven't read enough about those laws, but I think on an emotional, psychological level, it was quite daunting. Yeah. I mean, it was quite uh, damaging. When do you head back now? Because you've got this really uh, complex travel schedule ahead of you. Um, so the boys will be on a bus tomorrow morning, 7.30, uh, which is a very good thing because it makes sure that they don't go out too long tonight. Um, and they Are you sure about that? I mean, they could arrive for the bus at 7 o'clock. It's... <laughs> Anything's possible in Galway. Well, you guys must check the hotel because you might have to pick some of them up. We're not going to wait for them. Um, 7.30, we, we're heading home. And then we probably go from here to Dublin, Dublin, Doha, Doha, Durban. I mean, Joburg, Joburg, Durban, and then home. we finally be with our families. Well, that's good to hear because you're back on the road again next weekend. You're coming up. Uh, oh, you have a home game next weekend, and then you're back on the road to come up to take on Harlequins and Edinburgh. Um, just overall with where you are in the URC now, um, how do you feel about where you're set up and uh, where the game's going forward, particularly in this competition, although Europe is very important to you? Um, I think we're in a pretty decent place. Um, probably want to be one win, more, one win more, which is what we had the opportunity to do today and we didn't. Um, even if we had scored one more time and got a bonus point, I think it would have added to the momentum. Um, but I think as a group, we're in a pretty decent space because um, I think it's difficult to speak about the EPCR and the URC separately because the two, you build momentum off of each other. So as you're getting EPCR wins, those build momentum into your URC campaign. So I'd say as a union, collectively, even after these 80 minutes, I think we can look at ourselves and say we're in a pretty decent place. Um, we've left 17 of our best players in South Africa. We came here to a very difficult place, and we fought quite well. So I think if we all look back and look at the picture, I think we're still in the top eight, um, which is exactly where you want to start. So I think we're okay, and I think we the momentum can build, hopefully, towards a home playoff um, in the URC, which will be massive. Linda, you were just kind of making the point there that like, you know, as we come off the last of the interviews and we kind of wrap this up like a brilliant podcast during the week guys, you did a great job summing up where they were they had to win, they just had to win Yeah, look, this was this was almost like, I think I described in the advertiser this week as being the, one of those Rubicon moments where, you know, you actually this is it, they didn't have a choice, if they had have lost this match you may as well just, you know you know, put a seconds team out and all the babies out and all the academy out for the rest of the season because it was over. Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a very valid point that they knew this was happening. Yes, you know, the opposition sent over possibly their Curry Cup team as opposed to their, 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 their best team. But that doesn't make any difference, really. It was what Connett had to do to perform. Did, they had to perform enough. They had to score tries. They had to keep their shape. They had to... They had to basically win, and I think that's a very, it's a really important step for them that they actually showed up in this god awful weather that we had today. They didn't let it distract them at all. You know, they produced the number of tries that they needed to to get a bonus point one. And now, when you look at the table, all right, they still haven't reached that top eight yet, but they have closed the gap on, say, the Cell, Sh the Cell Sharks that have now dropped from fifth place to eighth place. So there's only, like, four points between them. Mm. So if I'm you glad they didn't give them a losing bonus point at the end. Well, you know, if, 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 think about it. It could have been, been Connaught on, was it 
21 points or whatever and them on 34. So, I mean, it's a huge, it's a, there's a huge difference. There's a huge swing between losing, and, you know, the difference between winning and losing. And the fact that they went out there with those temp, with some of the players on the pitch, as you say, like Cahill Ford, quite a young player, Turner Holleran, you know, reinvented it, at, you know, and it comes back on playing at 15. If you had have chosen that team that was going to go out there today, not knowing what the opposition team was going to be, would you have chosen some of those players? I'm not, you know, I'm not so sure. Who, who would have thought that Bundyaki would not be selected? We don't know the reasons. It's for Bree, perhaps, which seems strange. We don't know the reasons why, you know, but... Well, I don't, just I don't think he was playing well enough now, personally. I hope that's why. That's a personal opinion because he hasn't been playing well enough. And I think Tom Farrell, like Stormer at 13 today, outside Ford, who was really running the kind of lines he needed to. But now our final thoughts, we're kind of starting to wrap this up. Alan? Final thoughts. Um, it's a sort of any other business final thought. I would like to see rugby referees have the same little spray that the soccer referees have and put it down the middle of the line out. And then we want to spend half the time and then trying to force them apart. You'd have a line down the middle, just forward, they'd stand either side of it and it'd be fine. When, you know, I think that'd be a great little thing to have. Is that what you were giving out about in the clan terrace? I was just oh, listening to you those, all morning. One of those lasers instead. That would be quicker, wouldn't it? Just shine a laser. <laughs> <laughs> they do. I've seen in some rugby circles somewhere where they put a, a dot in South Africa at the moment for where the penalty has to be taken from. So if there's a penalty and you're about to kick to touch, he puts a little dot down. So I have seen that last week right. during the Christmas rugby. I, I'd say William Saw that. He's in the background Where's there. Where's the honesty coming from? Come on, you have to have honesty playing, playing the game. What, a player would take an extra half yard? No, not. Never happened in Ballon Road Rugby Club. Anyways, Dave, any final word? Oh, we should really mention that the ladies are out today. I think they, they had a very good first half performance. I was going to mention that. Was they, sorry, man. Um, I just think they just ran out of steam. They... Really? Fought back well though, and they got a good score at the key point. But Great. then, lovely, lovely, tr lovely try for Orla Dixon. Um, they, re I have to say, look, there was a lot of Leinster will feel they made an awful lot of mistakes in the first half. But my God, that was because they were forced into them. A lot of the clubs in women's rugby are based up in Dublin. The two big ones being Black Rock and Railway Union. A lot of the Leinster girls have come through their systems. A lot of our girls, they're not, they're, they're not full time professional sports people. I think they gave a really crack in first half and just ran out a bit of steam in the second. But William, William was watching and reporting for Galway Bay FM on this one. Welcome along. We heard your voice there interview. Matt Hansen. how are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Pleased with that uh, result this evening for Connick. Yeah, I thought the women uh, put in a decent enough shift. Few little errors at the end cost them. Um, they didn't do an awful lot of attacking. Leinster are a pretty good side, but they worked really hard in the first half, but they did run out of steam a little bit. Leinster's bench was also a bit bit stronger and I hope that'll give them a bit of uh, confidence going forward. They're off to Belfast next week to take on Ulster at uh, Ravenhill and um, yeah I hope that's a cracking game for them. Um, overall a good effort but Leinster are slightly better. For a lot of these players uh, who are playing today, it's a huge opportunity for them to put on, the, on a show for the Irish international management team. There hopefully will be a few kind of players who stood up there today and will be spotted. You'd like to think so. And it's not just, and it's also where they're playing it now. Like they're playing the games in proper stadiums. Like they're playing in Ravenhill <laughs> next week well, yeah, with yeah. good crowds. They're playing in Musgrave. They're playing in proper rugby stadiums, not just in you know, club, provincial club teams. I know Ashbourne was a great spot for the women when they played the internationals there, but to play the internationals in full-on stadiums is the way it should be. And that's what, we'd be, that's what we're looking for, and it's great to see the, the women getting to that opportunity to play with proper dressing rooms in Donnybrook. Yeah, the French do that, the Canadians do that, more of that, they're the leading teams that are, are doing it, and obviously England and New Zealand playing for such a huge crowd. Yes. We would still like to see our, the, the, the emphasis being put on 15s and players not being taken out away from provinces for sevens rugby. But that's a, I think that's a, we might be fighting on losing the battle on that one. All right. Uh, almost. Have any other business? Any other business? Any other business? Any other business? That's it from us, folks. Midweek podcast. Sign up. It's just a fiver. That's all it is. A fiver. And you get so much amazing coverage. The full press conference audio, which was interesting last week when William and Pete Wilkins were playing table tennis back and forth with questions. And it was interesting too when the three of you guys got together. And I still say go back and listen to the preview pod because it's a good commentary on the entire season and we're connected to go on some really interesting chat there. Love that. Well done. We'll talk to you during the week, folks. Uh, what's next? Brief. Yeah. Who? On to Challenge Cup. Five yeah. points, please. Yeah, yeah. We've some... Some audio from South Africa about uh, their interesting travels that they have to do to get to play in the European Cup and what they might want to be trying to do to fix that for next season. Oh, let's put that into the midweek pod for our special patrons. All right, Teresi, we'll talk to you in a week. Bye. Loose, cut it loose. 
break out or nothing changes side 